Someone once asked, how does great love happen? And this is what they said. They said, well, nobody knows. But what I can tell you is it happens in the blink of an eye. One moment, you're enjoying your life. And the next, you're wondering how you ever lived without them. That might sound familiar because it's from Hitch. (laughs) You know, I... I love that movie. One of the great, you know, rom-coms, early 2000s. Kind of makes me feel old thinking about how old that movie is. But I really enjoyed the movie because, of, you know, the, the big irony in the movie. The person who is like the professional at love, the expert at love. He didn't really know what love was. And so as the story progresses, he has to learn exactly what love is. And that's the way life is at times. Sometimes we don't know fully about a subject and we have to learn. And so in particular, we're going to talk this morning. By the way, good morning. How are y'all doing? Good. Open your Bibles to Luke. That's where we're going to be. Luke 7. Luke 7. And we're going to talk about the story of Simon and the woman who washes Jesus' feet. And we're going to learn a little bit about love and forgiveness. The title of the lesson, Love in Action, because that's exactly what we see from this story. And so as we are learning more about love and forgiveness and how that works together. And as we learn about how we can apply that to our lives, I'm essentially going to break this lesson up into three sections. That's not surprising. Uh, The points are going to be pendulum, pardon, and promise. I probably worked a little too hard to make those all P's, but that's what we've got. Pendulum, pardon, and promise. Again, we're going to talk about the story of the woman who washes Jesus' feet. And so we're going to begin with this thought of pendulum. And in order to really see the pendulum, we kind of have to understand Luke in its context. And so let's spend some time thinking about Luke and what he tends to focus on in his gospel. And, you know, I've preached a lot on Luke this year, and it's evident as you've gone through your Bible reading, it's evident that Luke tends to focus on the lowly. He tends to focus on the downtrodden, on the poor, on those people that everyone else keep at arm's length. He focuses on the outcast. And you see that throughout the book, by the way. Mary and her In her prayer in Luke 1, people call it the Magnificat, but she sort of sets up this theme for the entire book. And she talks about God and what God has done for her. And this is what she says about God. She says, he has done a mighty deed with his arm. He has scattered the proud because of the thoughts of their hearts. He has toppled the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has satisfied the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. And so there we see sort of the theme of the gospel of Luke, or at least one of the things that Luke likes to focus on. He likes to focus on how God is going to put this reversal in motion. He is going to scatter the proud, topple the mighty from their thrones. But you know what? He's going to exalt the lowly. He is going to send the rich away empty, but you know what? He's going to satisfy the hungry with good things. That is a huge theme in the gospel of Luke. Jesus draws closer to those that everyone else keeps at arm's length. As a matter of fact, Jesus, his first sermon in a synagogue, at least according to Luke, Luke kind of actually moves this. He strategically places this sermon in Luke 4 whenever he's in the synagogue at Nazareth uh, because the other gospels have that later in Jesus's ministry. And so Luke moves it to the foreground for a particular reason. It's interesting. Jesus does a lot of teaching in the synagogues in Luke, but this is the only one where we're told what he taught. He does a lot of teaching in synagogues, and we'll see that where while he was teaching in synagogue, there was a man with a withered hand, and so on and so. We'll see all of that in Luke uh, as we read through the gospel. But this is the only one where we're told exactly what Jesus taught. And I think the reason behind that is because this one is like symbolic of all of them. This is what Jesus tended to teach while he was at the synagogue. And so Luke 4, verse 16, it says, He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. As usual, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. And unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it was written. And so Jesus is intentionally choosing where in Isaiah he wants to read from. And this is the passage that he chooses. He reads, verse 18, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. 
He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He then rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down, and the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fixed on him, and he began saying, or he began by saying to them, Today, as you listen, this scripture has been fulfilled. And so Jesus, as he's summarizing his, I think that's what, why Luke puts this first. Right after Jesus is, is tempted by the devil, this is what he does. He teaches in Nazareth. And again, not chronologically, Luke moves it earlier for a reason. It's to show this is what Jesus is all about. Jesus is about preaching good news to the poor, proclaiming release to the captives to set free the oppressed. And so again, Luke focuses heavily on Jesus is drawing near to the people that everyone else, everyone else keeps them at arm's length. Jesus draws near to those people. And then so by the time you get to Luke 5, that's exactly what you see. Jesus and the leper. Everyone else keeps the leper at arm's length. Not Jesus. You see in Luke 5, Jesus with Peter. Peter's trying to keep Jesus at arm's length. Don't come near me. I'm a sinner. Jesus says, no, I'm going to draw close to you. Jesus and the tax collector also in Luke 5. Everyone else would, would, would keep the tax collector at arm's length. As a matter of fact, there was a tradition that the Jews had. And this tradition said, well, if you go into the house of a tax collector, you become unclean. And so tax collectors, they were shunned. They were shunned from religious service. They were shunned from going to uh, the synagogue or going to the temple. These were the people that everyone else kept at arm's length, but not Jesus. Jesus drew near to those people. And so that is sort of one of the things we see in Luke. Jesus drawing near to everyone that is kept at arm's length. But what does this have to do with the pendulum? Well, Sometimes what ends up happening in life is sometimes in order to avoid one extreme, we come all the way over here to another extreme. And so when Jesus was alive in that culture, the one extreme was, well, we're not going to associate with the lowly. We're not going to associate with the outcast. We're going to have nothing to do with them. We're going to keep them at arm's length. Well, notice as Jesus responds to that cultural norm, notice as Jesus responds to that, he doesn't go all the way over here and say, well, you know what? I'm not going to have anything to do with the wealthy people. I'm not going to have anything to do with the people of high class. As a matter of fact, I ask you to open your Bibles to Luke 7. The way this story begins, Luke 7 and verse 36. Luke 7 and verse 36. The way this story begins, it says, Then one of the Pharisees invited him to eat with him. And so he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And so Jesus didn't respond to, another, to one extreme by going way over here to, to the other extreme, saying, well, I don't want anything to do with the wealthy people, the people with high social status, high social class. That's not what he does. Yes, Jesus does correct their sort of mishandling of the poor. He does correct that. And he says, okay, I'm going to draw near to these people because those people need the good news too. But he, he also says, well... The wealthy person, the Pharisee over here, he also needs the good news. And so Jesus handles this pendulum thing very well. And so I think that's such a lesson for us because sometimes we don't handle the— Sometimes when we, we are trying to avoid this extreme, and so we go straight past the truth to this extreme over here. And this happens in a number of areas. Sometimes we exist one extreme with regards to the grace of God. And there is an extreme out there with regards to the grace. There's an extreme that says, well— God has saved me by his grace, and so I'm just going to live however I want. And that certainly is one extreme, and it's, it's not, that is not the gospel of Jesus. But sometimes we, in, in our effort to resist that extreme, we come over here to this extreme, and we put it all on us. Well, now it's all of, it's everything that I do. I, it's, it's based on my conduct. That is now what saves me. And ultimately, what ends up happening what ends up happening is people become so unsure, I guess, of their own salvation. And I, I don't mean to paint with a broad brush. I'm not saying that this happens everywhere. But sometimes as we're reacting to one extreme on grace, you know, we come way over here and we say, well, it's all about my conduct now. And that's what earns me salvation. And if that's what we think, then I don't know if you can ever be secure in your salvation. You know, it's interesting. I, I preached a sermon 
I don't know, maybe over the summer, where it was something along the lines of, if God asked you, why should I let you into heaven? What would your answer be? Maybe you remember that the sermon, maybe you don't. But I was, in that sermon, I dealt with some of that stuff. I dealt with, well, can we be secure in our salvation? And uh, one of our members who passed away now, but I, I went to visit them in the hospital. Death was sort of approaching. And one of the things they told me was that they really needed that sermon. Because they weren't secure in their own salvation. And if I get to this point where I'm saying in my, in my head, well, I sure hope that I get to heaven when I die, then maybe I don't understand the gospel of Jesus that well, or the way that I should. Anyway, it's interesting. Turn to 1 John. In 1 John, John tells us, I'm writing these things to you. Why am I writing these things to you? So that you may think. Oh, someone already caught me. Yeah, they already know. <laughs> so that you may know that you have eternal life. And it's interesting what, what he says, because I think, uh, obviously, he's inspired by the Holy Spirit, but he marries this idea of, of grace in our lives in a very good way. First John 1, we'll pick up in verse 7. First John 1, verse 7. John writes, if we walk in the light... As he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and the world is not in us. And so there's a contrast that John is building. There are people who say that they have no sin. And John says, those people are not in the light. But on the other hand, he says that there are people who confess their sin. They admit that they are a sinner. And so that is the contrast that John is building. But pay attention to what he says in verse 7, because this is important. He says, if we walk in the light, that's the context. The, he, he's addressing people who walk in the light. And this next sentence is about people who walk in the light. And if you walk in the light, what do we call that? We call that Christians. That's what we call that, right? He says, if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Notice the verb tense of cleanses. The, John does not say that if we walk in the light, the blood of Jesus cleansed us, because that's what some people might think. Well, you know, if we walk in the light, we don't sin anymore, and so the sin is in the past. The blood of Jesus cleansed us from our sin. But that's not what John says. John says, if we walk in the light, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from our sin. And what that tells us is there are people who walk in the light, who, loyal, who are loyal to Jesus, who make mistakes, and they are repentant of those mistakes because they're loyal to Jesus. And you know what Jesus does? He forgives them. That's what this teaches us. And so we've got to be careful that we don't go from one extreme over here because of a misunderstanding about grace, and we go right past the truth to this extreme over here. You know, it's, it's interesting because sometimes we can do the same thing with the Holy Spirit because there's one extreme that says, well, the Holy Spirit, he is working everywhere. People are speaking in tongues. People are being raised from the dead. And so in response to that extreme, some people might say, well, no, see, God, the Holy Spirit's not working today. Holy Spirit is only working through the word, but we just know from the Bible that that's not true. I mean, think about what Paul says in Romans 8. Paul says the Spirit helps us because we don't know how to pray as we should. But the Spirit intercedes for us. So at the very least, we know the Spirit is working apart from just the Word of God. But the Spirit is working in our lives. I appreciate Rod for highlighting that as he was leading singing, talking about how the Spirit dwells among the people of God. And certainly that's true because we are the temple of God. And so someone may look at Romans 8 and say, well, how does that work, Reuben? How does, if you can't explain it, then how do you know? I don't know how the Spirit works in my prayer, but I know that's what the Holy Spirit says. And so we need to make sure that we don't go from one extreme over here to this extreme over here, where the truth is probably in the middle. We just need to speak biblically and not worry about if we sound like this or this person or that person or this denomination or that denomination. Let's just speak biblically not have to worry about that. And so I think that's one of the things that we see just very early on. Jesus, he didn't get attached to this pendulum. He says, no, we're going to do the, the things God's way. 
And so that's a lesson for us. But notice with me also pardon. I probably should have named this forgiveness, but I was stuck on the whole, the whole alliteration thing. And so pardon. But whenever I say pardon, I'm thinking about forgiveness. And this story teaches us a lot about forgiveness and love. Let's read it and we'll do a little bit of explaining the text, a little bit of exegesis, and then we'll talk about the, uh, talk about the application. Luke 7 verse 36. We'll just read through the story. It says, then one of the Pharisees invited him to eat with him. He entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And a woman in the town who was a sinner found out that Jesus was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house. She brought an alabaster jar of perfume and stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to wash his feet with her tears. She wiped his feet with her hair, kissing them and anointing them with perfume. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, this man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him. She's a sinner. Jesus replied to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. He said, say it, teacher. A creditor had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. Since they could not pay it back, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one he forgave more. You have judged correctly, he told him. Turning to the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she with her tears has washed my feet and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she hasn't stopped kissing my feet since I came in. You didn't anoint my head with olive oil, but she has anointed my feet with perfume. Therefore, I tell you, her sins have been forgiven. That's why she loved much. But the one who is forgiven little loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this man who even forgives sins? And so a couple of things I want to note, just dealing with the text for a moment, and then we'll, we'll, we'll get into some application stuff. First of all, I want to notice a couple of things about the sinful woman, because she does she does a couple of things that are surprising. First of all, she washes Jesus' feet. We see that in verse 38. Uh, it says, and uh, she stood behind him. By the way, uh, sometimes we get a picture in our head of Jesus sitting at this table and the woman is under the table washing Jesus' feet. That's not really how fancy dinner parties worked in the ancient world. If a fancy dinner party in the ancient world, people would be reclining on a couch or something. And so if Jesus' feet are behind him, tells us he's laying on his stomach and so he's reclining on a couch on his stomach uh, or maybe on his side and there's like a table next to them and so they're they're it's not likely that she's under the table they are literally reclining that's how fancy dinner, dinner parties worked in the ancient world but anyway she washes his feet and the reason why i say that's surprising is because that is not something that even jewish slaves would be forced to do that's how shameful and degrading it was. As a matter of fact, uh, you kind of see it in what Jesus tells Simon. Jesus tells Simon, you did not give me water because that was actually the practice. The practice for Jews was if you were hosting a thing, you would, as a host, give someone water and they would wash their own feet. That was sort of the proper practice. And so the fact that she is washing, or washing Jesus' feet just shows how like low she's stooping and that would have been a surprise for anyone there she's like breaking all of these cultural norms to show love for jesus which is why it's surprising that jesus washes the disciples feet as well in john uh, but that's not the only surprising thing that we see about this woman she also wiped his feet with her hair and so to do that she would have had to untie her hair and that was again a big cultural sort of thing that you wouldn't do it was shameful for jewish women to unbind their hair in the presence of men it was sort of religiously shameful and so what we see from this woman is she like broke all of the cultural norms all of those sort of cultural no-nos to get to jesus because that's how much she loved him. And so I think it's important that we see that with regards to uh, the woman. With regards to Simon, just a couple of things that tie this, this chapter into the, to the previous context. And so uh, jump up to verse 29. Verse 29. This is essentially how the people who interacted with John 
how they also respond to Jesus. And so Luke 7 and verse 29, it says, When all the people, including the tax collectors, heard this, they acknowledged God's way of righteousness because they had been baptized with John's baptism. And so the lowly people, like the tax collectors, they are acknowledging God's way of righteousness, but since the Pharisees and experts in the law had not been baptized by him, they rejected the plan of God for themselves. And so we see the Pharisees are rejecting uh, God's plan, and we even see what they're saying. Verse 33 now, verse 33. It says, The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, Look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And so this section kind of flows from all of that. We see Jesus being a friend to sinners, and we see the Pharisees not liking that so much, even going as far as to say, well, he must not be a prophet because he doesn't know this woman. And then Jesus goes on to say, ah, but I know your thoughts, so what does that make me? makes me a prophet, right? And so that's sort of what Jesus is doing. And he even says, I'm more than a prophet because he forgives sins, but more on that a little bit later. All right, let's talk about the theme. Let's start getting into some application and how we could apply this to our lives. And so let's read that. Let's read that parable again. Verse 41. Verse 41, it says, a creditor had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, the other 50. And since they could not pay it back, he graciously forgave them both. And so which one of them will love them more? And Simon says, well, I suppose the one he forgave more. And so Simon says, well, the one who has been forgiven the larger debt, that person will love more. A couple things about this parable. First of all, first of all, that parable is kind of ridiculous. And someone says, well, how can you say that? Jesus' parable is kind of ridiculous. This parable is kind of ridiculous. And what I mean by that is no one does this. Whether it's 50 denarii or 500 denarii, That's a lot of money. You know, sometimes we try to like do the math a little bit where we'll say, well, what's a day's wage today? And we try and calculate that all out. That does not work uh, because of based on how things like, for instance, things in Palestine cost less than things in Rome. And so Jews typically didn't get paid a day's wage, but that's neither here nor there. It's difficult to calculate. Okay. It's difficult to calculate that sometimes. 50 denarii is a lot of money for a Jew living in Palestine. No one would just forgive that. And 500 Denarii is even more. And that's why I say it's ridiculous because no one forgives debts that large. If you don't believe me, go to your banker and ask them to forgive your mortgage. No one does that. And so the parable is kind of, kind of ridiculous because it's not something that anyone would do. But at the same time, it's a great picture of the gospel, isn't it? Because what that parable does is it brings, it, br- it brings hopeless situation because that's what their situation was. It was hopeless. It says in verse 42, they could not pay it back. It brings hopeless situation together with an impossible gift. And the reason why I say the gift is impossible is one, because no one could do that. And two, who can forgive sins but God alone? I can't forgive my own sins. And so it's impossible. And so this parable brings together a hopeless situation with an impossible gift. And that is exactly what the gospel is. And so Jesus is explaining forgiveness and love to Simon. Uh, He says, let's pick up in verse 44. Verse 44, it says, turning to the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water, but she has washed my feet with her tears, so on and so forth. You gave me no kiss, but she hasn't stopped kissing my feet. You didn't anoint my head, but she anointed my feet with perfume. Verse 47 is important. This is, I think, our point of application. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. That's why she loved much. But the one who is forgiven little loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. What Jesus wants Simon to do is Jesus wants Simon to compare himself with this woman. Jesus says, this woman loves me so much. Why? Because her sins have been forgiven. Sometimes it depends on your translation. Sometimes we get it backwards. We think that this woman was forgiven because she loved Jesus so much. That is not what the parable taught, is it? Why did the debtors love the creditor? Because they, because they were forgiven. And so in this case, the forgiveness came first and then the love. And that's the way my translation translates it. Her many sins have been forgiven. That's why she loved much. And then Jesus goes on to say, your sins are forgiven, probably just reiterating the fact. What I think happened, and this is Reuben's translation. You don't see this in scripture. I think Jesus had forgiven this woman in the past. And now she's coming to to repay that, so to speak. You can't ever repay it, but you guys understand what I'm saying. And so her sins that were many have been forgiven. And that's why she loved much. And the irony is, this is the irony. The irony is Simon is just as much a sinner as this woman. 
Because here's what Jesus is not saying. Jesus is not trying to teach, if you sin less, then you love me less. That doesn't make any sense, does it? Jesus isn't trying to teach that. He's trying to get us all to see that we are the woman. You gotta be careful how you say that these days, I suppose. We are that woman in the text. That's what Jesus wants us to see. We are all in her shoes. And so the reason, it's interesting, Simon is just as much a sinner as the woman is. Why doesn't he love Jesus as much? It's because he doesn't realize it. He doesn't realize it. As a matter of fact, you think about why Jesus is even eating with Simon. I mean, what has Jesus said consistently throughout the letter? It is the sick who need a physician, not the healthy. He says, I have come to seek and save the lost. Why is he even dining with Simon? Because Simon's a sinner, that's why. And Simon needs forgiveness too. And so I think there's an important point of application for us. We are all in the position of this woman. You know, sometimes we get into this stage of life where we don't really feel connected to Jesus. We don't really feel that we love God the way that we should. And we ask, well, how can I rebuild that love? And I think Jesus gives us the answer. Her many sins have been forgiven and that's why she loved much. If we truly want to love Jesus, then we've got to realize, look at this, look at this verse again. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven and that's why she loved much. But the one who is forgiven little loves little. If we truly want to love Jesus, then we've got to realize that that second part of the phrase applies to no one. He who is forgiven little loves little. That's not me. And it's not anyone else in this building. You know, if we think, if, 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 if we start to think, well, I'm the person, I, I, I'm a pretty good person. I'm pretty good. I haven't sinned that much. At least I'm not like that tax collector over there. If we start to think that way, then we're just going to think, I don't, we don't need Jesus. I mean, think about the rich ruler. All these I have done from my youth. And so he walked away. He thought he was pretty good. Didn't think he needed Jesus, and he walked away. If I get into this mentality where I'm like, oh, I'm not that bad, then I start thinking, well, I don't really need Jesus. As a matter of fact, you talk to people who don't really go to church, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good, that's why. But the way that Jesus describes this woman could be described of all of us, her many sins, that's me. And when I really realize that, then I will cling to Jesus like my life depends on it. Daryl Bach is a New Testament scholar. He wrote, a, a, I think, a good commentary on Luke, but it's very technical, has a lot of Greek words. I don't really recommend it for, for just anybody. But he says, love is a response to previous forgiveness. He's talking about this parable. He goes on to say, according to the parable, the basis of love is a previously extended forgiveness that produces a response of love. And so Jesus indicates that the woman's actions reflect her experience of forgiveness from him. And I like what she says, or excuse me, what Daryl says, what he says is that the woman's actions are because she loved Jesus so much. And that was because Jesus forgave her, kind of tracing it all the way back. And I think that's also an important lesson for us because sometimes, sometimes we focus a lot on actions. Well, if I could just get them to sit, if I can get them back here, if I can get them to sit in the pew, then everything will just be good. But you know what? People leave for a reason. They leave because their heart's not really with God. And if we don't fix that, it doesn't matter if they're here. We could be all here and we could all be doing the right things, but if I don't have a heart for God, I'm just as lost as the person who's not doing the right things who don't have a heart for God. And so we've got to realize that the heart is important. And so if we truly want to change people's actions, we've got to point them to Jesus. We have to help them realize what Jesus has actually done for them. And once they realize that, maybe they'll have a heart for God. You know, it's interesting. There is a, a preacher who's long since died, died in the 1960s. His name is A.W. Tozer. And he says, no law has ever been passed that can compel one person to love another. For by the very nature of it, love must be voluntary. No one can be coerced or frightened into loving anyone. If we want people to live like Christians, we just got to make sure they really do love Jesus. It's interesting. That's what Paul says 
In Titus 2, Paul talks about the grace of God. And what does the grace of God do? It offers salvation. He's talking about forgiveness. And once we realize that, once we understand God's grace, what does it do? It instructs us, he says. It instructs us to deny godlessness and to be people for Jesus' own possession, eager to do good works. You want to change people's actions? Change their hearts. Gerald Bach, that same scholar, said, Love emerging from forgiveness changes the direction of one's life. We need to have, heart. We need to have a heart for God. And I believe that we can only have a heart for God. We can only truly love God if we realize what he has done for us. How deep the Father's love for us. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The Father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. This second verse, I think, is... Really, I I like the whole song, but this second verse really applies to what we're talking about. Behold the man upon the cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. When we realize that, we can't do anything but cling to Jesus. Pardon, forgiveness. Let's move on to the third point, uh, promise. I want to talk a little bit about, let's try that again. There we go. We'll talk a little bit about the promise that Jesus makes. He kind of implies it. Uh, and it's the verse that I, that I didn't read, verse 50. Verse 50. I want to just focus on those last three words in verse 50. He says, and he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. I want to think about those three words. Go in peace. Where is this woman going to go to find peace? Apparently, this woman was a sinner. And she was a sinner in, the, in a way that everyone knew about it. Simon said, if uh, this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman this is. She is a sinner. She had done this sin, and everyone knows. And so what do people do? They just keep her at arm's length. And so where is she going to go to find peace? The only place where she truly would be welcomed is among sinners like her. And so what Jesus' words are is they are, they are uh, a promise, I guess. They're implying something. Jesus' words imply that this woman is going to be able to find a community where she can find peace. That's what Jesus is implying. This woman is going to be able to find a community where she is truly welcomed. And so what type of community does she need? She needs a community of people who are are forgiven sinners and forgiving sinners. But where is she going to find that? Only in the church. Only in God's kingdom. And so I think, that's, that's why I chose the word promise. I was going back and forth between peace and promise, and I settled on promise. Jesus telling this woman to go in peace implies that there is a community for her to find peace in. It looks forward to the church. And so Jesus is promising this woman, there is going to be a community where you will be accepted. And so the question that we need to ask ourselves is, are we a community where broken sinners can find peace? There's a really good commentary uh, on Luke in the interpretation series. And this is one that I would recommend. It's by Fred Craddock. And this is what he says about this text. He says, here are two religious leaders. He's talking about Simon and Jesus. He says, here are two religious leaders suddenly in the presence of a sinful woman. One has an understanding of righteousness which causes him to distance himself from her. The other understands righteousness to mean moving towards her with forgiveness and a blessing of peace. And so the question for, I think he's hit the nail on the head. So the question for us is how do we understand righteousness? Does our righteousness mean that we distance ourselves from the broken and the vulnerable? Or does it mean we draw close to them with the message of the good news? The news that everyone needs. You see, Luke is painting the picture of God's kingdom as being a community where the people who don't belong do belong. So let me ask, have you ever felt like you didn't belong? You didn't belong with your coworkers, you're just different from all of them, or you didn't belong with your family or just whatever it may be. Have you ever felt that way? Because what Jesus promises, he promises that you will fit in to his kingdom and his community. Jesus loves us. We are a community of fallen people who are lifted up by our King. Uh, 
Martin Luther said, I've got a lot of quotes. Martin Luther said, God does not love us because we are valuable. We are valuable because God loves us. And if we realize that, how could we not cling to him? People do everything to cling to life. Jesus is life. He offers life to a dying people. How does great love happen? Nobody knows. But what I can tell you is that it happens in the blink of an eye. One moment you're enjoying your life and the next you're wondering how you ever lived without them. How do we ever live without Jesus? Jesus is the one who wants you. And he offers you a community where you are welcomed as long as you're loyal to him. Do you want to know more about that? Then please come and see as we stand and as we sing.